Slaves of the Dust by Sophie Wenzel Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew. Slaves of the Dust by Sophie Wenzel Ellis. It's a poor science that would hide from us the great, deep, sacred infitude of nescience, whither we can never penetrate, on which all science swims as mere superficial film. Carlyle The two Batalues turn from the open waters of the lower Tapajo River into the Igarape, the lily-smothered shallows that often mark an Indian settlement in the jungles of Brazil. One of the two half-breed rubber-gatherers suddenly stopped his Batalue, by thrusting a paddle against a giant clump of lilies. In a corruption of the Tupi dialect, he called over to the white man occupying the other frail craft. We dare go no further, master. The country of the Ongapoks is bewitched. It is too dangerous. Fearfully, he stared over his shoulder towards a spot in the slimy water where a dim bulk moved, which was only an alligator hunting for his breakfast. Hale Oakham, as long and lanky and level-eyed as Charles Lindbergh, ran despairing fingers through his damp hair and groaned. But how can I find this jungle village without a guide? The caboclo shrugged. The village will find you. It is bewitched, master. But you will soon see the path through the matto. Can't you stay by me until time to land? I don't like the looks of these alligators. It is better for a white man to face an alligator than for a caboclo to face Ungapuk. Once they used to kill and eat us for our strength. Now, again, his shrug was eloquent. Now, Hale prompted impatiently, the white god who put a spell on these one-time cannibals will bewitch us and make us wash and rejoice when it is time to die. He shuddered and spat at a caiman that was lumbering away from his batalue. Hale Oakham laughed, a hearty, boyish laugh for a rather learned young professor. Is that all they do to you? he asked. No. All who enter this magic motto die soon, rejoicing. Before the last breath comes, it is said their bodies turn into a handful of silver dust. Poof! Like that! He snapped his dirty fingers. Then the life that leaves them goes into the rocks that walk. Hale sighed resignedly. There wasn't any use to argue. Unload your battle, he ordered testily, and get your filthy carcasses away. The half-breeds obeyed readily. As the departing battle turned from the Igarape into the open water of the river, the young man repressed a sudden lifting of his scalp. He was in for it now. His long body sprawled out in the battle he paddled about aimlessly for several minutes until he found an aisle through the jungle. The path that led to the village which he was visiting in the name of science, and for a certain award. Before plunging into that waiting tangle where life and death carried on a visible, unceasing struggle, he hesitated. Instinctively he shrank from losing himself in that mad, green world. He had first heard of the Ungapuks at the convention of the Nessians Club in New York. That body of scientists, near scientists, and adventurers linked together for the purpose of awarding the yearly Woolman Prizes for the most spectacular addition of empiric fact to various branches of science. One of the members of the club, an explorer, had told a wild yarn about a tribe of Brazilian Indians headed by Sir Basil Addington, an English scientist, who was conducting secret experiments in biochemistry in his jungle laboratory. The explorer had said that the scientist, half crazed by a powerful narcotic, had seemingly discovered some secret of life which enabled him to produce monsters in his laboratory and to change the physical characteristics of the Ungapuk Indians who, in five years, had been transformed from cannibals into cultured men and women. And now Hale Oakham, hoping to win one of the Woolman Prizes, was here in the country of the Ungapuks, entering the jungle path that led to the unknown. Fifty feet from the Igarape, the path curved sharply away from a giant tree. 
Hale approached the bend with his hand on his gun. Just before he reached it, he stopped suddenly to listen. A woman's voice had suddenly broke forth in a wild, incredibly sweet song. Hale stood entranced, drinking in the heady sounds that stirred his emotions like Masada, the jungle intoxicant. The singer approached the bend in the path, while the young man waited eagerly. The first sight of her made him gasp. He had expected to see an Indian girl. No sane traveler would imagine a white woman in the Amazon jungle, with skin as amazingly pale as the great, fleshy Victoria Regia lilies in the Igarape. When she saw Hale, she stopped instantly. With a quick, practiced twist, she reached for the bow flung across her shoulders and fitted a barbed arrow to the string. She was a beautiful barbarian, standing quivering before him. In the thick, dull gold braids hanging over her bare shoulders flamed two enormous scarlet flowers, no redder than her own lips pouted in alarm. There was a savage brevity to her clothing, which consisted only of a short skirt of rough native grass and breastplates of beaten gold, held in place by strings of colored seeds. The girl held out an imperious hand, and in perfect English said, Go back! Hale drew his long body up to its slim height, folded his arms, and gave her his most winning smile. His insolence added to his wholesome good looks. Why, he exclaimed, I've come a couple thousand miles to call on you. He saw that the eyes which held his levelly were pure and limpid and of an astonishing orchid blue. Who are you? Her throaty, vibrant voice was a thing of the flesh, whipping Hale's senses to sudden madness. I'm Hale Oakham, he said, a little tremulously. A lone, would-be scientist knocking about the jungle. Well, won't you tell me your name? She nodded gravely. I am Anya. I, too, am white. Her rich voice was quietly proud. Come, I'll see if Aimu will receive you. With surprising, childlike trust, she held out her little hand to him. The gesture was so delightfully natural that Hale, grinning boyishly, took her hand and held it as they walked down the jungle path. Sing for me, he demanded abruptly. Sing the song you sang just now. That? asked the girl, turning the virgin blue fire of her eyes on him. That was my death song that I practice each day. Perhaps soon I shall be released from this. She passed her hands over her beautiful, half-clothed body. Hale's warm glance swept over her. Do you want to die? Yes. Don't you? But you do not, or you would not have retreated from my poisoned arrow. No, Anya, I want to live. To live? And be a slave of this? Again, her hand went over her slim body. A slave of a pile of flesh that you must feed and protect from the agonies that attack it on every side? Bah! But I am hoping that my turn will come next. Your turn for what, Anya? To enter the room of release. Perhaps, if Aimu approves of you, you too may taste of death. Her gentle smile was beatific. Do you speak of Sir Basil Addington? He was called that once, before he came to us. Now he has no name. We can find none holy enough for him. So we call him Aimu, which means good friend. Her beautiful face was sweet with reverence. And now, in the distance, Hale saw that the path led into a large clearing. He slowed his pace, for he wanted to know this lovely girl better before he joined the Ungapuks. Who are you, Anya? he asked suddenly, bending closer to the crinkled, dull gold hair. I am Anya, a white woman. She looked at him frankly. But who are your parents? How did you get among the Ungapuks? Anya's red lips curved into a dewy smile. I thought all white men were wise, like Aimu. But you are stupid. How do you think a white woman could appear in a tribe of Indians who live in the jungle, many weeks' journey from what you call civilization? Hale looked a little blank and more than a little disconcerted. I suppose I am stupid, he said dryly. But tell me, Anya, 
How did you get here? Why? she exclaimed. He made me. M made you? Good Lord, what do you mean? Just what I said, Hale Oakham. If he can take a few grains of dust and make a shoot that will grow into a giant tree, like yonder monster Itauba, don't you think he can create a small white girl like me? Her orchid blue eyes glowed innocently into his. The eager questions that he would have asked froze upon his lips, for a party of Indians approached. The six nearly naked red men came close and surveyed him, toying nervously with their primitive, feather-decorated weapons. A tall, handsome young fellow, who possessed something of the picturesque perfection of the North American Plains Indian, stepped forward and, in perfect English, said, Good morning, white stranger. What is it you wish of the Ungapux? I came to see your white cacique, said Hale. Aimu? What is it you wish of Aimu? He is ours, white stranger. Yes, he is yours. I come as a friend, perhaps to help him in his great work. Perhaps. The young Indian folded his bronze, muscular arms over his broad chest and continued his cool survey of Hale. White men before you have come, spies and thieves. Some we poisoned with curari. Others Aimu took into the room of release. He turned to Anya, who was still standing by Hale, and his expression softened. What shall we do with him, Anya? he asked the question. A fleeting look of hunger swept his fine, flashing eyes. Anya flushed beautifully, and, moving closer to Hale, with an impulsive, almost childish gesture, slipped her arm through his. Let us take him to our village, Unaniasu, she suggested. I like him. It was Hale's turn to flush, which he did like a schoolboy. Unaniasu's brows drew together in a scowl. The hand holding his blowpipe jerked convulsively. Anya, come away, he growled. You mustn't touch a stranger. Anya's blue eyes stretched with astonishment. But I like to touch him, Unaniasu. The tall Indian, with a half-comical gesture of despair, said, Don't misunderstand her, stranger. She is young, very young, ah, and she has known only the reborn men of the Ungapux. He stepped firmly over to Anya and, taking the girl by the arm, drew her away. Run ahead, he commanded, and tell Aimu that we come. Anya, her feathered bamboo anklets clicking together, sped away. Unani Asu bowed courteously to Hale. Come, stranger. If you are an enemy, it is you who must fear. He motioned for him to proceed down the jungle path. The path ended at a clearing studded with malacas, the Indian grass huts made of plaited straw. Altogether the scene was peaceful and sane, and far removed from the strange tales that Hale had heard concerning the Ungapuks. Hale was conducted to a long, low stone building where, in the doorway, stood a tall and emaciated white man. Aimu, said the Indians reverently, and bowed themselves. Over the bare, brown backs, the white man looked at Hale. Sir Basil Addington? asked the young man. Yes, you are welcome. Come in. Hale entered the building. He was in a book-filled study, furnished with handmade chairs and a desk. Sir Basil asked him to be seated. He offered the young man long, brown native cigarettes and a very good drink made from yucca. After several minutes of conversation, Sir Basil suddenly changed his manner. And now, he shot out, eyeing the young man through narrowed lids, will you please state the purpose of this visit? Hale looked squarely at his questioner. Frankly, Sir Basil, I have called on you because I am so intensely interested in your work among the Ungapuks that I wish to offer my services. He gave in detail his family history, his education, and his experience as a teacher and a scientist. Sir Basil tapped his teeth thoughtfully with a pencil. But why do you think you can be of assistance to me? That, of course, is for you to decide. 
Hale thought that the scientist looked like a huge, starved crow in his loose-fitting coat. He was so fleshless that, when the light fell strongly on his face as it did now, the bones of his head and hands showed through the skin with horrible clearness. Hale, under Sir Basil's scrutiny, decided instantly that he did not like him. "'I need a helper,' the scientist went on, with an air of talking to himself. "'A white assistant who neither loves nor fears me. Unaniasu is good enough in his way. But I need a helper who has had technical training.' Suddenly, he wheeled on Hale and asked sharply, "'How are your nerves, young man?' Hale started, but managed to answer calmly. "'Excellent. My war record isn't half bad, and that was surely backed with good nerves. "'And you say you have no close relatives, no ties of any sort to interfere with work that is dangerous, and something else. "'Not a soul would care if I passed out today, Sir Basil.' "'Good.' And now tell me this. Are you one of those scientists whose minds are so mechanical, so mathematically made, as it were, that your entire outlook on science is based on old, established beliefs? Or do you belong to that rare but modern type of trained thinker and dreamer who refuses to permit yesterday's convictions to influence today's visions? Hale smiled quietly. I recently lost my chair in a famous university because of my so-called unscientific teachings regarding ether drift. Expressing himself in purely scientific terms, he went into an elaboration of his revolutionary theory. When he had finished, Sir Basil reached out his claw-like hand to him. Good, he approved. You have dared to think originally. Now listen to my theory of mind electrons, which has grown into the established fact that I have discovered the secret of life and death. The long, thin hands reached into a pocket for a box of pills. He swallowed one greedily, and immediately his emaciated face seemed charged with new virility. He spoke out suddenly. Our world, you know, is made up of three powers, matter, energy, and what you call life. I might really say that there are but two powers, for matter, in its last analysis, is a form of energy. And what is life? You can't call it a form of energy, for every inorganic atom has energy without having life. Life, Mr. Oakham, is mind or consciousness. He began pacing the floor restlessly. Everything that lives has this consciousness, and I say this in defiance of some fixed scientific views. The amoeba in a stagnant pool, a thalophyte on a bit of old bread, any of the myriad trees and plants that you see in the jungle all have consciousness as well as you. And why? He brought his fist down upon the table. Because they issue from the same source as you and I. The almighty mind, eternal, indestructible, which has permitted itself to be enslaved by matter. You are Hale Oakham. I am Basil Addington. Yet we are one and the same. Let me illustrate. He seized a glass and poured it full of masada. Look, two portions of masada, but I pour what is in the glass back into the bottle. The molecules cohere and the two portions become one again. Some day, you and I, our individual consciousnesses, will flow back to the whole. That sounds mystical, but listen. We scientists hold that the electron explains nearly all the physical and chemical phenomena. I go further and say that it explains all. Matter, electricity... Light, heat, magnetism, all can be reduced to the ultimate unit. So, Mr. Oakham, I am going to make clear to you how life itself is electronic. His long finger touched Hale's arm. You, I, yonder mosquito on your sleeve, even one of the germs that is causing my malaria, all being individual living things, are the ultimate units of what I shall personify as the mind. 
When I say you, I do not speak of that mound of flesh in which you exist, and which can be reduced to the same familiar basic elements and compounds as make up inorganic structures. I speak of your mind, your consciousness, for that is the real you. Are you following me? Perfectly, Sir Basil. Hale reached for another drink. But do you mean to say that you and I are no more than a mosquito, a malaria protozoan, or even one of those trees in the jungle? Sir Basil's dry skin slipped back into a long smile. Startling, isn't it? You, I, and all other living organisms are nothing but matter, energy, and consciousness. You and I have a larger share of consciousness because our organic structure permits the mind electrons greater freedom over the matter that composes our bodies. We are more acutely aware of the universe about us, have a greater facility for enjoyment and suffering, a more intricate brain and nervous system. Yet, when our bodies die and our consciousness is released, the mind electrons enslaved by our atoms go back to the elemental whole. This holds good for protozoan, the tree, the man, for all things that live. Hale was drinking again. You mean, Sir Basil, that there is a sort of war waged against what you personify as the mind by matter? that matter is constantly seeking to enslave mind electrons so that it may become an organism which, for a while, may enjoy what we call life. Sir Basil pushed back his tufted hair and looked happy. Yes, and it's nature's supreme blunder. In the end, the mind always conquers and gains its release. Yet the eternal chain of enslavement goes on and on, and will continue to go on as long as there is a living organism in the world to bind mind to matter. Hale was excited now, as much from the fiery intoxicant as from the scientist's weird revelation. I get you, he said rather inelegantly for a professor. You mean that if every living thing in the world should pass out, every man, every plant, every animal, even down to microscopic infusoria, the mind would collect all its electrons and through some more jealous law of, er, uh, cohesion, hold these electrons inviolate from matter and energy. Right. And again, as in the beginning, the mind would rule supreme. But what I have proved, you and I and all the other creatures that now have life may, as separate unfleshed electrons, enjoy eternal consciousness as part of the mind. A new passion leaped to his dark eyes. When I have finished my mission, no more need we be slaves of the dust, subject to all the frightful sufferings of this dunghill of flesh. He brought his fist down upon his skinny leg with a resounding blow. But you cannot reduce your theory to fact, Sir Basil. No. Again came that frightful grin to his cadaverous face. Can you withstand shock? If you mean shock to the eye, let me remind you that I served two years in the big fight. Then come to my laboratory. Better take another drink. While Hale helped himself again from the Masata bottle, Sir Basil swallowed another pellet. Then the two went into the adjoining apartment. Sir Basil had his hand over the doorknob, paused. Before we go in, he said, I want you to remember that we call natural that which is characteristic of the physical world. Everything alive in this laboratory was produced by nature. I merely made available the materials, or... Rather, I made the conditions under which matter was able to enslave mind electrons. He opened the door, slipped his body through, and with his ugly, teeth-revealing grin, gestured for Hale to follow him. Hale steeled himself and looked around half-fearfully. The first glance took in a large, well-equipped laboratory somewhat fetid with animal odors. The second lingered here and there on cages, aquariums, incubators, and other containers where creatures moved. Suddenly, as something scuttled across the floor and disappeared into a hole in the wall, Hale cried out and covered his eyes with a hand. Sir Basil laughed aloud. Why didn't you examine it closer? 
Hale looked nauseated. My God, Sir Basil, a rat with a man's head and face? Sir Basil's voice was sharp, decisive. Before you leave this laboratory, you're going to come out of your foolish belief that man is a creature apart from other living organisms. You, the conscious you, is no greater, no more important in the final balance than the spark of consciousness in that rat. When your body and the rat's body give up their atoms to nature's laboratory, the little enslaved mind electron that is you and the one that is the rat will be identical. Again, Hale shivered and turned away from that cold, too thin face. The scientist was speaking. Step around to all those cages and pens. I want you to see all my slaves of the dust. But long before Hale had encircled the room, he was so disturbed at what he saw that he could scarcely complete his frightful inspection. In every enclosure he viewed a monstrosity that in some way resembled a human. Every reptile, every insect, every queer, misshapen animal not only looked human in some shocking manner, but also seemed to possess human characteristics. It seemed as though some demented creator with a perverted sense of humor had attempted to mock man by calling forth monsters in his image. At last, the young man cried out, How did you breed these freaks? They are not freaks, and I did not breed them. They are nature's parentless products whose basic elements were brought together in this laboratory, and by a scientific reproduction of the functions of creation, endowed with the life principle, which is merely mind electrons. He smoothed his long tuft of hair nervously. Would you like to see how life springs from a wedding of matter, energy, and consciousness? I suspect I can stand anything now, Hale admitted. Then come and peep into a very remarkable group of apparatus I have developed, where you can watch atoms building molecules and molecules building living organisms. You say I can see atoms? Not directly, of course. The light waves will forever prevent us from actually seeing the atom. But I have perfected a system of photography which magnifies particles smaller than light waves, and, separating their images from the light waves, renders details clear in the moving pictures. He went to a huge machine, or series of machines, which took up all the center floor space of the laboratory, where he busied himself in an intricate network of wires, mirrors, electrodes, ray projectors, and traveling metal compartments. Presently, he called out to Hale. Let me remind you, Oakham, that while any scientist can break up any of the various proteid molecules which are the basis of all living cells, animals and vegetable, no scientist before me has been able to compound the atoms and build them into a proteid molecule. He bared his teeth in the smile that Hale hated. I am proud to tell you that the proteid molecule can be built up only when the third element of nature's trinity is added, the mind electron. I have found a means of capturing the mind electron and of bringing it in contact with proteid elements, and now it is possible to bring forth life in the laboratory. Come closer and watch proteid forming protoplasm, protoplasm forming a cell, and the cell evolving into, well, what do you want? An animal, plant, or an insect? Hale had fallen under the scientist's spell. He did not feel foolish when he said, Let's have a rat. Hale became so absorbed in the wonders of the laboratory that when lunchtime came, Sir Basil had food brought to them. While they were eating a very good vegetable stew, farina, and luscious tropical fruits, a sudden, agonized scream rang out, followed by other screams and wails. Sir Basil opened the door and looked out. Anya came running forward. Her blue eyes were flooded with tears. Oh, Aimu, she moaned. A tree fell on Unani Asu. She buried her beautiful face in her hands and sobbed aloud. Sir Basil frowned heavily. I can't lose Unani Asu yet, he declared. He is a wonderful help around the laboratory. Is he dead? No. We should rejoice if his time of release has come. But his legs, Aimu, no one wants to suffer and be crippled. Even in her distress, 
The girl's voice was rich and vibrant, and every tone moved Hale curiously. Hurry! cried the scientist. Have them bring him here before he dies. The girl leapt to her feet and sped away. Come, Oakham, continued Sir Basil. Here is a rare opportunity for you to see how completely I have mastered the laws that govern organic matter. Help me prepare. For several minutes, Hale worked under the scientist's sharp-spoken directions. By the time the injured man was brought to the laboratory, Sir Basil was ready for him. Unani Asu was still conscious, but his pale face indicated that he had lost much blood. When the improvised stretcher was lowered to the floor, Sir Basil sent all the Indians away. Unani Asu opened his eyes and called feebly, Anya! Be still, ordered Sir Basil. Anya is not here. Please, gasped the dying man. I want her, my Anya. Sir Basil sucked in his breath sharply. What's this? Have you been making love to Anya again, after my warning to you? The sufferer stirred uneasily. No, he panted. But perhaps my hour of release has come, and I want to look at her once more. The scientist smiled unpleasantly as he eyed the magnificent body, which looked like a broken statue in bronze. Some human characteristics are strange, he muttered. In spite of everything I do, this fellow continues to love Anya, Anya whom I intended for myself. He stepped to the apparatus and swiftly changed one of the adjustments. Perhaps, he resumed, with a gleam in his eye that chilled Hale, this will forever cure him. In another moment, the still, half-dead body was lifted and gently slipped into a compartment. Before Hale's horrified gaze fastened on the eyepiece, which revealed moving pictures of every process that went on within, Unani Asu's body was reduced almost instantly to a fine, silvery dust. Good God! he cried. You've killed him! The scientist's teeth showed in his wide smile. Think so? Does a woman destroy a dress when she rips it up to make it over? Do you mean me to understand that you can reduce a living body to its basic elements and then rebuild these elements into a remade man? Watch, warned the scientist. Hale looked again and saw the silver dust that was once a living being being whirled into a tiny, grub-like thing. He saw the grub expand into an embryo and the embryo develop into a fetus. From now on the development was slower, and he often stopped to talk with Sir Basil. Once he asked, If this man had died naturally, could you have brought him back to life? Sir Basil shook his head. No. Once the mind electron is completely freed from its enslavement by matter, it is forever beyond recall by the body it has just vacated. Like atomic electrons, whose equilibrium disturbed break away from their planetary system and go dashing off into space, only to be drawn into another planetary system, the mind electron may be enslaved almost immediately by extraneous matter. Had Unani Asu died, his liberated mind electron might at once have been captured by a jungle flower going to seed. Immediately a new seed would be started. And now the former Unaniyasu would be a seed of a jungle flower, later to find new life as a plant. Suddenly the scientist threw up his hand and cried, You see? The mind will be eternally enslaved as long as there is life. Oh, for the time of deliverance! He gazed fanatically into space, as though he dreamed magnificently. Hale observed him thoughtfully. When the great brain weakened, the consequences would be frightful. Sir Basil, as though he had made a sudden decision, went over to that part of his machine which he called the molecule disintegrator. Oakum, he called out. I have taken you partly into my confidence. Now I want to show you something. Come here. Hale obeyed with misgivings. The scientist pointed out the window to a group of Indians, anxious relatives of Unani Asu. Watch he ordered. Turning one of the projectors on the machine towards the window, he sighted carefully and pressed a button. 
Immediately, one of the Indians fell to the ground and struggled. His companions began dancing around him in evident joy. Faintly to the laboratory came a familiar chant, which Hale recognized as Anya's death song. Dust to dust, mind to mind, he will shed his body as the green snake sheds his skin. As Hale watched, the struggling Indian's body seemed to shrink, and then, instantly, it disappeared. Watch them scatter the dust, said the scientist. One of the Indians stooped and blew upon the grass. What have you done? Hale gasped. You've killed this one. Oh, I see now. These poor devils are totally ignorant that you are killing them for practice. They worship you while you turn them to silver dust. He turned angrily on the scientist, as though he longed to strike him. Keep cool, young man. Sir Basil held up his fleshless hand. There is no death. Change, yes, but no permanent blotting out of consciousness. Can't you see the horror of it as nature works? When your time for release comes, as it inevitably will, your mind electron might find new enslavement in a worm. Hale's reply came hotly. If that is true, why do you murder these poor devils deliberately? My dear Oakham, perhaps you are not so brilliant as I had hoped. All that I have done thus far is only child's play, in preparation for my real work. Haven't you guessed by now what I'm getting ready to do? No, I'm a poor guesser. The scientist made a gesture of mock despair. Then let me tell you. The molecule disintegrator is active only on organic structures. When I concentrate it so... He reached out again, sighted the projector on some point beyond the window, and pressed a button. One single living organism passes out. See that jupati tree by the rock disappear? Before Hale's eyes, the tall, slender tree melted into air. But, continued Sir Basil, if I should broadcast my molecule disintegrator on electron magnetic waves, destruction would pass out in all directions, following the curve of the Earth's surface, penetrating Earth, air, water. He wet his lips carefully. You understand? Hale stiffened suddenly. I understand. No life could survive these vibrations of destruction? Through every corner of the Earth where life lurks, they would reach. Yes, cried Sir Basil. There would be not a blade of grass, not a living spore, not a hidden egg. Think of it, Oakham. No more would the clean air and sweet earth reek with life, and at last the ultimate mind electron would be released forever. He was breathing fast, and his emaciated face burned with two red spots. Hale thought rapidly. He was convinced now that the fate of all life lay within that diabolical network of chemical apparatus. At last, he said, And what of you and I, Sir Basil? Shall we, too, be caught in this wholesale destruction? Not immediately, replied the scientist. Of course, I want to remain in the flesh long enough to be sure that my purpose has been accomplished. I have provided a way for my own safety. If you desire, you may remain with me. He smiled craftily. I have planned to keep Anya also, the woman who I called into life and made as I wished. His words pounded against Hale's tortured ears with almost physical force. With a supreme effort, the young man controlled his rage and despair. Anya needed him too much now for him to risk defeat by showing his emotions. To Sir Basil he said, But if all life disappears from the earth, what shall we do for food, you, Anya, and I? Sir Basil lifted his brows. You don't think I overlooked that, do you? What is food? Various combinations of the basic elements. I, who have conquered the atom, need never worry about starving to death. All this time, the machinery had been humming, and now the humming changed its note to a shrill whistle. Sir Basil went to the eyepiece and looked into it. Opening a door in the machinery, he disappeared inside. He came out soon, flushed and evidently elated. Bring that stretcher, Oakham, he ordered. Hale brought the stretcher, placing it close to the machine. 
Then Sir Basil opened a metal door and gently eased out a human body. It was Unani Asu, unconscious but alive and breathing. Hale helped the scientist to get the man on the stretcher, noticed that the crushed legs were perfectly healed. Together they bore him to a long seat. The Indian's eyes were still closed, but his even breathing indicated that he was only sleeping. Suddenly, Hale pointed a finger and cried out, My God, Sir Basil, look at his hands and feet! Unani Asu, still laying like a recumbent bronze statue sculpted by a master, was perfect from shoulder to wrist, from thigh to ankle, but somewhere in that diabolical machine through which he had passed, his hands and feet had undergone a hideous metamorphism, which had transformed them from the well-formed extremities of a splendid young Indian into the hairy paws of a giant rat. Hale turned away his head, sick with disgust. Sir Basil cut the silence triumphantly. Now he'll never again face Anya with love in his eyes. What? broke in Hale. Did you plan this monstrous thing? Of course. I told you I should forever cure him of his mad infatuation. But why didn't you kill him as you killed the others? It would have been the most merciful way. Sir Basil showed his teeth in his ugly smile. A creator is never merciful. A quiver passed through the Indian's body, and presently he sighed deeply and opened his eyes. He seemed dazed, puzzled. He looked from Hale to the scientist, and turned seeking eyes to other parts of the laboratory. Anya, he called weakly. Where is Anya? He pulled himself a little unsteadily to his feet, to the spatulated, hairy, rodent feet that had come out of the life machine. Staggering, he would have fallen had he not thrown out his arms to steady himself. Instinctively, he tried to grasp something for support, and then, for the first time, he discovered his deformity. Hale was never to forget that expression of horror and disgust that swept over the Indian's face as he spread open his revolting extremities and stared at them. A sudden, wild roar of despair rang through the room. I move! My hands! The scientist smiled with evident amusement. You are a grotesque sight, Hunaniasu. Do you want to see Anya now? The fright and horror faded from the Indian's face, for now he glared with hate into the mad, mocking eyes. You did it, the Indian ground out. You've made me into a thing from which Anya will run screaming. Through the quiet rage of the perfectly spoken English ran a thread of sorrow. Aimu, whom we considered too holy to name. Choking, he hobbled away to the door, which he unbolted. As he passed out into the open, Sir Basil went over to the machine and began sighting the projector which cast forth the ray of destruction. No, cried Hale. You've done enough murder for today. The scientist paused. I was trying to be merciful, and then I wonder if it is safe to let him go on hating me. Oh, well, he shrugged his narrow shoulders. I seldom leave the laboratory, and certainly nothing can harm me here. He touched the death projector significantly. Hale made a mental decision. I must find out how the damn thing works and put it out of commission. With this determination uppermost in his mind, he assumed a more intense interest in that strange laboratory. For the next two days, he assisted Sir Basil so assiduously that he learned much about the operation of the life machine. And gradually, he stopped being horrified as the fascination of producing life in the laboratory grew upon him. After he had assisted the scientist in building living organisms from basic elements, he ceased to cringe when he remembered that perhaps it was true that Anya was created in the mysterious life machine. Once the scientist declared, She is untainted with inheritance. She is the perfect mate that I called into life so that before I pass from the flesh, I may taste that one human emotion I've never experienced. Love. That very night Hale kept a secret tryst with Anya after the village slept. Sweet, virginal Anya, who knew less of the world than a civilized child of twelve, what a sensation she would create in New York with her beauty, her culture, her natural fascination. 
With her in his arms and an orange tropical moon hanging low in the hot, black sky, he ceased to care that she had no ancestors. For now, his one passionate desire was to save her from Sir Basil and to hold her forever for himself. He might have been content to go on like this for months, tampering with creation in the daytime, courting Anya in secret at night, had not Unani Asu come back for revenge. On the fourth night after Unani Asu had disappeared into the jungle, Hale went to the Igarape to meet Anya. He had gone only half the distance when he encountered her, running frantically up the path towards him. Hale! she gasped, falling into his opened arms, where she lay panting and exhausted. Hale gently patted the long braids, shimmering in silver tangles under the moonlight, and, crushing the soft little trembling body close, he murmured, What's the matter, darling? She dug her face deeper into the bend of his arm. Oh, Hale, I saw Unani Asu a few minutes ago. For several moments she was unable to go on. Her sudden sobs cut off her breath. It's terrible, Hale, what Aimu did to his hands and feet. But what Unani's going to do to Aimu is still more terrible. Hale placed his hand gently under her chin and tilted up her small, pale, tear-drenched face. Be calm, Anya, and tell me plainly. Still clinging to him, she went on. He told me that Aimu is a devil, Hale. He showed me his hands and asked me if I could ever get used to them and be his squaw. The round gold breastplates and the necklace of painted seeds clicked together over her panting bosom. I told him about you, Hale, and he seemed to go mad. He said he'd kill Aimu tonight. But Anya... Why did he let you go, knowing that you would give the alarm? He didn't let me go. Her petaled lips parted in a faint smile. I escaped. Unani Asu tied me to a tree by the Igarape. Because he doesn't hate me, he could not bear to tie me too tightly. Then he must be close to the laboratory now. If he breaks in upon Aimu, oh my God. Hale remembered the death projector. If Sir Basil were in danger of attack, he would not hesitate to touch the waiting button that would broadcast death throughout the world. He seized Anya's little hand and cried out, Run, Anya! The only safe place now is Aimu's laboratory. Run! As they dashed on madly, Hale opened wide his nostrils to scent the heavy, flower-laden air of the jungle. Any moment all this sweet, rich life might vanish instantly. He had a horrible vision of a world devoid of life a world of bare rocks, dry sand, odorless dead waters. For it was life that greened the landscape, roughened the stones with moss and lichen, thickened the ocean with ooze, and turned the dry sand into loam, life that swarmed underfoot, overhead, all around. And now, just as they reached the laboratory door, panting and frantic, a hoarse shriek broke forth. Dragging Anya after him, Hale dashed forward, conscious of two masculine voices raised in passion. The door to the room where the life machine performed its vile work was locked. Hale pounded against it and called out to Sir Basil, but only curses and the sound of tumbling bodies came from beyond the door. Although originally the door had been thick and strong, the destructive forces of the tropics had pitted and rotted the wood. A few blows of Hale's shoulder broke it down. Under the brilliant electric light, Sir Basil and Unani Asu were fighting upon the blood-spattered floor. The struggle was uneven. The scientist's emaciated body was no match for the splendid strength of the young Indian. Help Aimu! cried Anya, pushing Hale forward. Aimu was being choked to death. Hale acted fantastically but efficiently. Catching up a bottle of ammonia, he moistened a handkerchief and clasped it against Unani Asu's nose. Instantly, the Indian choked, releasing Sir Basil, and fell back, gasping for breath. Hale thrust the handkerchief into his pocket. Get out, he ordered Unani Asu. Quick! He threatened him with the ammonia bottle. But Unani Asu was not looking at the bottle. Aimu! He screamed, pointing. When Hale saw and understood, he leapt across the room to plant his body in front of Anya. For Sir Basil was behind the life machine, reaching for the controls of the ray projector. Suddenly, from behind Hale, a silver streak shot across the room. 
Sir Basil groaned and sank to the floor of the laboratory. A keen-bladed dissecting knife, thrown by Anya, stuck out from his left breast. Anya ran forward, sobbing wildly. Oh, Aimu, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to strike you there. Only your hand, Aimu. I didn't want Hale to die, Aimu. I didn't... Oh! She was on her knees by the scientist's side, his head held in her slender arms. He's breathing, she rejoiced. Some Masata. Hale, quick! Hale found a bottle of good brandy, which he had contributed from his own supplies. Soon Sir Basil gasped and opened his eyes. He stared about him wildly, then gasped. I'm dying, Hale Oakham. Quick, the life machine, before my mind electron escapes. He tried to pull his body up, but fell back weak and panting. Hale hesitated, looking doubtfully at Anya. For God's sake, quick, screamed Sir Basil. I'm dying, I say. I must have rebirth. Lift me to the disintegrator. Hurry. His voice trailed off faintly. He is dying, snapped Hale. We might as well try it. He jerked open the door to the disintegrator. Here, Unaniasu, lend me a hand. Instantly, the Indian came forward, a peculiar, pleased expression on his handsome face. In a moment, Sir Basil's body was inside, and the machine began its weird humming, the humming that indicated the transformation of a human body into dust. Now, cried Unani Asu exultantly, going behind the machine, I have helped him enough to understand that if one changes this, and this, and this, he made some rapid adjustments on the machine, something that is not pleasant will happen. Stop, cried Hale. What did you change? The Indian laughed mockingly. Wouldn't you like to know? But yet you should not worry. You have no cause to love him, have you? I can't be a traitor, Unaniasu. Arrange the machine as it was originally, and I give you my word of honor that when Sir Basil comes out, I'll wreck the damn thing beyond repair. See, Unaniasu? You and I, together, will smash it. The Indian folded his arms so that the repulsive things that should have been his hands were hidden. It's too late now, he admitted, shaking his head. Yet I've done no more to him than he did to me. Hale went to the eyepiece in the machine and started to look inside. Unani Asu stepped forward, tapped him on the shoulder, and, fingering significantly the dissecting knife which he had picked up, said, I am operating the machine. Will you sit over there by Anya and wait? It won't be long. And, white stranger, remember this. I am your friend. I am turned against none but our common enemy. He pointed significantly to the machine. Two hours passed, long, silent hours for the watchers in the laboratory. Anya fell asleep in a sweet, childish bundle upon the piled cushions, her golden hair, still decorated with the red flowers which she always wore, crushed and withered now. Several times, Hale caught Unaniasu gazing at her sadly, his own look saddened when it rested on the Indian's strong, outraged body. The humming of the machine changed to a whistle. Placing his fingers on his lips in a signal of quiet, Unaniasu whispered, Let Anya sleep. She mustn't see this. Opening a door in the machine, his handsome face lighted with a grim smile. He whispered exultingly, Watch. A scuttling sound issued forth, and then, half-drunkenly, an enormous rat tumbled out. One of those horrible rats with the hairless, human-like faces that had so frequently come from the life machine. Hale could not crush back the cry that issued from his throat. Where is Sir Basil? he gasped. There, cried the Indian, pointing to the kicking rat, which was fast gaining strength. Hale staggered back. No, you don't mean it, do you? Unani Asu turned the rat over with a contemptuous toe. Yes, I mean it. Behold Aimu, the man who thought himself creator and destroyer, the man who said that a human being was no higher than a rat, 
Perhaps he was right, for see this thing that was once a man. Hale buried his face in his hands. Kill it, Unani Asu! Kill it! Unani Asu's low laugh was metallic. You kill it! Hale uncovered his face. Open the disintegrator! Gingerly, he reached for the rat's tail. But his hand never touched the animal. The hairless face turned for a second, and the little beady eyes blinked up at Hale, with an expression that his fevered imagination thought almost human. Then, like a dark shadow, the rat dashed away. Once around the room it scampered, hunting for an exit. Hale started in pursuit. He was almost upon the animal again when, leaping up from his grasp, it landed on a low shelf where chemicals were stored. Several bottles fell, filling the room with fumes. Another bottle fell, and suddenly, amid a thunderous roar, the ceilings and wall began falling. Some highly explosive chemical had been stored in one of the bottles. Hale was thrown violently against the couch. His hand touched Anya's body. One last shred of consciousness enabled him to pick her up and drag her out. In the open, he fell, aware, before the blackness descended, that flames leapt high over the laboratory building and that Unani Asu lay dead within. Hale and Anya, leaning over the deck rail of a small steam launch, gazed into the dark waters of the Amazon. We ought to reach Para by morning, said Hale. And then, dearest, we're off for New York. Anya, wearing one of the first civilized dresses she had ever donned, and looking as smart as any debutante, slipped her hand into her husband's. Isn't it a shame, Hale, she moaned, that the fire burned all the animals and insects, the machinery, and even your notes? Her beautiful face saddened. Just one or two specimens might have been proof enough for your, uh, what you call it, club? The Nessians Club, darling. No, I can't expect to win the Woolman Prize, but I've won a prize worth far more. He squeezed her little hand and looked devotedly into her blue eyes. And Anya? I've reasoned out something concerning mind electrons which even Sir Basil overlooked. What is it, Hale? He maintained that matter seeks always to enslave mind electrons. But I'm convinced that mind electrons seek to enslave matter. Understand? It's creation, Anya. Had Sir Basil succeeded in broadcasting death throughout the world, the freed mind electrons, as in the beginning, would have started again to vitalize inorganic atoms. And in a few million years, which is no time to the mind, the world would be humming with a new civilization. Large thought, eh, sweetheart? End of Slaves of the Dust by Sophie Wenzel Ellis Recording by Ian Bradford Nunga Nunga Taha Pew. You can find me at ianpew.com I-A-N-P-U-G-H dot com The Undersea Tube by L. Taylor Hansen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew. The Undersea Tube by L. Taylor Hansen. If my friend the engineer had not told me the tube was dangerous, I would not have bought a ticket on that fatal night and the world would never have learned the story of the Golden Cavern and the City of the Dead. Having therefore, according to universal custom, first made my report as the sole survivor of the much-discussed undersea tube disaster to the International Committee for the Investigation of Disasters, I am now ready to outline that story for the world. Naturally, I am aware of the many wild tales and rumors that have been circulated ever since the accident but I must ask my readers to bear with me while I attempt to briefly sketch not only the tremendous difficulties to be overcome by the engineers, but also the wind propulsion theory which was made use of in this undertaking, because it is only by understanding something of these two phases of the tube's engineering problems that one can understand the accident and its subsequent revelations. It will be recalled by those who have not allowed their view of modern history to become too hazy, 
that the close of the twentieth century saw a dream of the engineering world at last realized, the completion of the long-heralded undersea railroad. It will also be recalled that the engineers in charge of this stupendous undertaking were greatly encouraged by the signal success of the first tube under the English Channel, joining England and France by rail. However, it was from the second tube across the Channel and the tube connecting Montreal to New York, as well as the one connecting New York and Chicago, that they obtained some of their then radical ideas concerning the use of wind power for propulsion. Therefore, before the undersea tube had been completed, the engineers in charge had decided to make use of the new method in the world's longest tunnel, and upon that decision, work was immediately commenced upon the blueprints for the great air pumps that were to rise at the two ends, Liverpool and New York. However, I will touch upon the theory of wind propulsion later and after the manner in which it was explained to me. It will be recalled that after great ceremonies, the tube was begun simultaneously at the two terminating cities and proceeded through solid rock, low enough below the ocean floor to overcome the terrible pressure of the body of water over it, and yet close enough to the sea to overcome the intensity of subterranean heat. Needless to say, it was an extremely hazardous undertaking. Despite the very careful surveys that had been made, for the little parties of workmen could never tell when they would strike a crack or an unexpected crevice that would let down upon them with a terrible rush the waters of the Atlantic. But hazard is adventure, and as the two little groups of laborers dug towards each other, the eyes of the press followed them with more persistent interest than it has ever followed the daily toil of any man or group of men ever before or since. Once the world was startled by the extra ye announcing that the English group had broken into an extinct volcano whose upper end had apparently been sealed ages before, for it contained not water but air, curiously close and choking perhaps, but at least it was not the watery deluge of death. And then came the great discovery. No one who lived through that time will forget the thrill that quickened the pulse of mankind when the American group digging through a seam of old lava under what scientists called the Ancient Ridge broke into a sealed cavern which gleamed in the probing flashlights of the workers like the scintillating points of a thousand diamonds. But when they found the jeweled casket, through whose glass top they peered curiously down upon the white body of a beautiful woman, partly draped in the ripples of her heavy red hair, the world gasped and wondered. As every schoolchild knows, the casket was opened by curious scientists, who flocked into the tube from the length of the world. But at the first exposure to the air, the strange liquid that had protected the body vanished, leaving in the casket not the white figure, but only a crumbling mass of gray dust. But the questions that the finding of the cave had raised remained unanswered. Who was this woman? How did she get into the sealed cavern? If she had been the court favorite of that mythical kingdom, now sunk beneath the waves, and had been disposed of in court intrigue, why would her murderers have buried her in such a casket? How had she been killed? An unknown poison? Perhaps she had been a favorite slave of the monarch. This view gained many converts among the archaeologists, who argued that from all the evidence we have available, the race carrying the Iberian or Proto-Egyptian culture, long thought to have been the true refugees from sinking Atlantis, were a slight, dark-haired race. Therefore, this woman must have been a captive. Geologists, analyzing the lava, announced that it had hardened in air and not in water, while anthropologists classed the skull of the woman as essentially more modern than either the Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon types. But the engineers, secretly fuming at the delay, finally managed to fill up the cave and press on with their drills. Then, following the arguments that still flourished in the press, came a tiny little news article and the first message to carry concern to the hearts of the engineers. The sea had begun to trickle in through one slight crack. Perhaps it was only because the crevice was located on the English side of the now famous Ancient Ridge that the article brought forth any notice at all. But for the engineers, it meant the first warning of possibly ultimate disaster. They could not seal the crack, 
and pumps were brought into play. However, as a month wore on, the crack did not appear to widen to any material extent, and the danger cry of a few pessimists was forgotten. Finally, it will be remembered that sounders listening in the rocks heard the drillers of the other party, and then, with wild enthusiasm, the work was pushed on to completion. The long tube had been dug. Now it only remained for the sides at the junction to be enlarged and encased with cast iron, while the work of setting up the great machines designed to drive the pellet trains through was also pushed on to its ultimate end. Man had essayed the greatest feat of engineering ever undertaken in the history of the planet, and had won. A period of wild celebration greeted the first human beings to cross each direction below the sea. Did the volume of water increase that was carried daily out of the tube and dumped from the two stations? If it did, the incident was ignored by the press. Instead, the fact that some cranks persisted in calling man's latest toy unsafe only attracted more travel. The undersea tube functioned on a regular schedule for three years, became the usual method of ocean transit. This was the state of matters when on the 4th of March last, our textile company ordered me to France to straighten out some orders with the France house, the situation being such that they preferred to send a man. Why they did not use radio vision, I do not care to state, as this is my company's business. Therefore, upon entering my apartment, I was in the midst of packing when the television phone called me. The jovial features of Dutch Higgins, my one-time college roommate and now one of the much-maligned engineers of the undersea tube, smiled back at me from the disc. Where are you? I thought we had a sort of dinner engagement at my apartment, Bob. By gollies, I forgot, Dutch. I'll be right over, before it gets cold. Then immediately I turned the knob to the municipal aerial car yards and ordered my motor, as I grabbed my hat and hurried to the roof. In due time, of course, I sprang the big surprise of the evening, adding, And of course, I'm going by the tube. I feel sort of a half-partnership in it because you are one of the designers. A curious, half-pained look crossed his face. We had finished our meal and were smoking with pushed-back chairs. He finished filling his pipe and scowled. Well, why don't you say something? I thought you'd be, well, sort of pleased. He struck his automatic lighter and drew in a long puff of smoke before answering. Wish you'd take another route, Bob. Take another route? Yes. If you want it straight, the tube is not safe. You're joking. But as I looked into his cold, thoughtful blue eyes, I knew he had never been more serious. I wish that you would go by the transatlantic airliners. They're just as fast. But you used to be so enthusiastic about the tube, Dutch. Why, I remember when it was being drilled that you would call me up at all kinds of wild hours to tell me the latest bit of news. He nodded slowly. Yes, that was in the days before the crack. Yet you expected to take care of possible leaks, you know, I countered. But this crack opened after the tunnel had been dug past it, and lately it has opened more. Are the other engineers alarmed? No. We are easily taking care of the extra water, and again, the opening seemed to remain at a stationary width, as it has for the past three years, but we cannot caulk it. Are you going to publish these views? No. I made out a minority report. I can do no more. Dutch, you are becoming overcautious. First sign of old age. Perhaps, with the old smile. But after all, it's now more than three years since we have had a talk on the tube. After it began to function as well as the Air Express, you sort of lost interest in it. And the world did, too. Certainly, but the public ever was a fickle mistress. Who said that before me? He laughed and blew out a long puff of smoke. Everyone, Bob. But as to the tube, if I cross under the sea, I would want to be as well informed on the road as I was three years ago. Now, in the meantime, you have dropped interest in the long tunnel while I have become more interested in textiles, with the result that I have forgotten all I ever did know, which, compared to your grasp of the details, was little enough. But his face showed none of the old-time animation on the subject. What a different man, I mused to myself 
from that enthusiastic engineering student that I used to come upon dreaming over his blueprints. He was considered half-cracked in those days when he would enthuse over his undersea railroad, but his animated face was lit with inspiration. Now the light was gone. Well, Dutch, how about it? Are you going to make me that brief little sketch of the length plan and the cross-section of the tube? I remember your sketch of it in college, and it tends to confuse me with the real changes that were made necessary when the wind propulsion method was adopted. All right, old-timer. You remember that the tube was widened at the sides in order that we might make two circular tubes side by side, one going each way. I had forgotten they were circular. That is because of pressure. A circle presents the best resistance. And picking an odd envelope from his pocket, he made the following sketch and passed it to me. Illustration, cross-section of the tube, consisting of a half-circle with thick metal outer casing whose interior is filled with concrete into which two large metal transport tubes are suspended, along with several smaller drainage pipes fitted beneath along the flat bottom edge. I nodded as I recognized the cross-section. Now the plan of the thing is like this, he added, putting aside his pipe and pulling a sheet of paper from the corner of his desk. Rapidly, with his old accuracy, he sketched the main plan and leaned over as he handed it to me. You see, he explained, picking up his pipe again, both pumps work at the same time. In fact, I should say all four because this plan is duplicated on the English side. On both ends, a train is gently pushed in by an electric locomotive. A car at a time goes through the gate so that there is a cushion of air between each car. The same thing happens in Liverpool. Now, when the dew train comes out of the suction tube, it goes on out the gate, but the air behind it travels right on around and comes in behind the train that is leaving. But how are you assured that it will not stall somewhere? It won't be likely to with pressure pumps going behind it and suction pumps pulling from in front. We can always put extra power on if necessary. Thus far, the road has worked perfectly. How much power do you need to send it through, under normal conditions? Our trains have been averaging about 50 tons, and for that weight we have found that a pound pressure is quite sufficient. Now, Taking the tunnel's length is 4,000 miles, of course it's not that long, but round figures are more convenient, and the tube width 11 and 1 quarter feet each, and working this out we have 3,020,000 cubic feet of air per minute, or 2,904,000 cubic feet of compressed air, which would use about 70,000 horsepower on the air compressor. But isn't the speed rather dizzying? Not any more dizzy, Bob, than those old-fashioned money-carrying machines that the department stores used to use. That is, in comparison to size. The average speed is about 360 feet a second. Of course, the train is allowed to slow down towards the end of its run, even before it hits the braking machinery beyond the gate. But how much pressure did you say would be put on the back of the diaphragm? I remember that each car has a flat disc on the back that fits fairly tightly to the tube. The pressure on the back is less than seven tons. However, the disc does not fit tight. There are several leaks. For instance, the cars are, as you know, run on the principle of the monorail, with a guiding rail on each side. The grooves for the rail, with their three rollers, are in each car. There is a slight leakage of air here. You used the turbo type of blower, didn't you? Had to because of the noise. We put some silencing devices on that, and yet we could not kill all of the racket. However, a new invention has come up that we will make use of soon now. But I can't understand, Dutch, why you seem so put out when I announced my intention of going to Europe via the tube. Why, I can remember the day when that would have tickled you to death. You followed the digging of the tube, didn't you? Yes, of course. You remember the volcano and lava scenes? Yes. Well, I do not believe the crack was a pressure crevice. If it had been, we were far enough below the ocean floor to have partly relieved the situation by the unusually solid building of the tube. The tremendous shell of this new type of specially hardened metal, and the rich concrete that was used as filling. That was one job no one slipped up on. I remember how you watched it. 
Yet the crack has widened, Bob, since the tube was completed. How can you be certain? By the amount of water coming through the drain pipes. But you said that once more it was stationary. Yes, and that is the very thing that proves, I believe, the nature of the crack. I don't follow you. Why, it isn't a crack at all, Bob. It's an earthquake fault. Good heavens, you don't mean... Yes, I do. I mean that the next time the land slips, our little tube will be twisted up like a piece of string, or crushed like an eggshell. That always was a rocky bit of land. I thought in going that far north, though, we had missed the main line of activity. I mean, the disturbances that had once wiped out a whole nation, if your scientists are correct. Then you mean that it's only a matter of time? Yes, and I have been informed by one expert that the old volcanic activity is not dead either. So that is what has stolen away your laugh. Well, I'm one of the engineers, and they won't suspend the service. Fate has played an ugly trick on you, Dutch, and through your own dreams, too. However, you have made me decide to go by the tube. He took his pipe out of his mouth and stared at me. Sooner or later that tube will be through, and I have never been across. Nothing risked, a dull life. Mine has been altogether too dull. I am now most certainly going by the tube. A bit of old fire lit up his eyes. Same old Bob, he grunted as I rose, and then grasped my hand with a grin. Good luck, my boy, on your journey, and may old Vulcan be out on vacation when you pass his door. Thus we said goodbye. I did not know then that I would never see him again, that he also took the train that night in order to make one last plea to the International Committee, and so laid down his life with the passengers for whom he had pleaded. It was with many conflicting thoughts, however, that I hurried to the great terminus that fatal night, where after being ticketed, photographed, and tabulated by an efficient army of clerks, I found myself in due time being ushered to my car of the train. For the benefit of those who have never ridden upon the famous flyer, I could describe the cars no better than to say that coming upon them by the night as I did, they looked like a gigantic shiny worm of strange shape, through whose tiny portholes of heavy glass in the sides glowed its luminous vitals. I was pompously shown to the front car, which very much resembled a tremendous cartridge, as did all the other segments of this great glow-worm. Having dismissed the porter with a tip and suspicion that my having the front car was the work of my friend, who was willing to give me my money's worth of thrill, and that the porter was aware of this, I stowed away my bags and started to get ready for bed. I had no sooner taken off my coat than the door was opened and an old fellow with a mass of silver hair peered in at me. "'I beg your pardon, sir.' but I understand you have engaged this car alone. Yes. I can get no other accommodation tonight. You have an extra berth here, and I must get to Paris tomorrow. I will pay you well. I smiled. Take it. I was beginning to feel lonesome anyway. He bowed gravely and ordered the porter to bring in his things. I decided he was a musician. Only artists go for such lovely hair but he undressed in dignified silence, not casting so much as another glance in my direction, while, on my part, I also forgot his presence when, looking through the porthole, I realized the train had begun to move. Soon, the drone of the propelling engines began to make itself heard. Then, the train began to dip down, and the steel sides of the entrance became too high for me to see over. My friend of the silver hair had already turned off the light, and now I knew by the darkness that we had entered the tube. For some time I lay awake thinking of Dutch and the ultimate failure of his life's dream as he outlined it to me, and then I sank into a deep, dreamless sleep. I was awakened by a terrible shock that hurled me up against the side of the compartment. A dull red glow poured through the porthole, lighting up the interior with a weird, bloody reflection. I crept painfully up to the porthole and looked out. The strangest sight that man has ever looked upon met my eyes. The side of the wall had blown out into a gigantic cavern, and with it the rest of the cars had rolled down the bluff a tangled, twisted mass of steel. My car had almost passed by, and now it's still stuck in the tube. 
even though the last porthole through which I peered seemed to be suspended in air. But it was not the wrecked cars from which rose such wails of despair and agony that held my attention, but the cavern itself. For it was not really a cave, but a vast underground city whose wide marbled streets stretched away to an inferno of flame and lava. By the terrible light was lit up a great white palace with its gold-tipped scrolls, and closer to me the golden temple of the sun, with its tiers of lustrous yellow stairs, stairs worn by the feet of many generations. Above the stairs towered the great statue of a man on horseback. He was dressed in a sort of tunic, and in his uplifted arm he carried a scroll as if for the people to read. His face was turned towards me, and I marveled even in that wild moment that the unknown sculptor could have caused such an expression of appeal. I can see the high intellectual brow as if it were before me at this moment, the level, sympathetic eyes and the firm chin. Then, something moving caught my eyes, and I swear I saw a child a living child coming from the burning city, running madly, breathlessly from a wave of glowing lava that was threatening to engulf him at any moment. In spite of all the ridicule that has been showered upon me, I still declare that the child did not come from the wreckage, and that he wore a tunic similar to the one of the statue, and not the torn bit of a nightgown or sheet. He was some distance from me, but I could plainly see his expression of wild distraction as he began to climb those gleaming stairs. Strangely lustrous in the weird light was that worn gold stairway, gold, the ancient metal of the sun. With the slowness of one about to faint, he dragged himself up, while his breath seemed to be torn from his throat in agonizing gasps. Behind him, the glowing liquid splashed against the steps, and the yellow metal of the sun began to drip into its fiery cauldron. The child reached the leg of the horse and clung there. Then suddenly the whole scene began to shake, as if I had been looking at a mirage. While just behind my car, I had a flashing glimpse in that lurid light of an emerald green deluge bursting in like a dark sky of solid water. And in that split second before a crushing blow upon my back, even through the tangle of bedclothes, knocked me into unconsciousness, I seemed to hear again the hopeless note in that voice of my friend as he said, An earthquake fault! After what seemed to me aeons of strange, buzzing noises and peculiar lights, I at last made out the objects around me as those of a hospital. Men with serious faces were watching me. I have since been told that I babbled incoherently about saving the little fellow, and other equally incomprehensible murmurings. From them I learned that the train the other way was washed out, a tangled mass of wreckage just like my car, both terminus stations wrecked utterly, and no one found alive except myself. So although I am to be a hopeless cripple, I am not sorry that the skill and untiring patience of the great English surgeon, Dr. Thompson, managed to nurse back the feeble spark of my life through all those weeks that I hung on the borderland. For, if he had not, the world never would have known. As it is, I wonder over the events of that night as if it had not been an experience at all but a wild, weird dream. Even the gentleman with the mass of silver hair is a mystery, for he was never identified, and yet in my mind's recess I can still hear his cultured voice asking about the extra birth, and mentioning his pressing mission to Paris. And somehow he gives the last touch of strangeness to the events of that fatal night, and in my mind he becomes a part of it no less than the child on the stairs, the burning inferno that lit the background, and the great statue of the unknown hero who held out his scroll for a moment in that lurid light, like a symbol from the sunken city of the dead. The End End of The Undersea Tube by L. Taylor Hansen Recording by Ian Bradford Nungunungataha, Pew. You can find me at ianpugh.com, i-a-n-p-u-g-h dot com.